Thank you for staying on. <laughs> Hello, um, this is going to be a short session and in English, if anyone wants to ask a question in German, I'd be happy to translate for Pat. <laughs> so my name is Lili Fu. I work uh, for the Heinrich Böll Foundation here in Berlin, working on international environmental politics and policies, but I'm also um, uh, a member of the board of the Etc. Group or ETC Group, the Action Group on Erosion, Technology and Concentration. And Pat Mooney here is the founder of Etc. Group. He's actually just a year ago stepped down as the, as the director, handed it to the next generation. But he's still very much involved in this work on um, um, horizon scanning of technologies, technology assessment. Um, and um, this session is um, um, one where we'll be talking about corporate concentration and how technology is driving corporate concentration, how technology and big data companies are buying into the food chain and how that's changing our agricultural systems. And basically the question that Pat will address is, what do we do about this? Do we need some kind of new UN treaty? Do we need um, new laws and regulation at the national EU regional level? Or how could technology assessment look like from a civil society and bottom-up perspectives? And how do these different fields work together? So we'll, we basically only have 25 minutes. It'll be really short. Pat will speak for about 10 minutes and then we'll open up for questions. And there's another session where the two of us will be present again with another colleague from the Tactical Technology Collective to tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., where we have one hour, so a little bit more time to talk about efficiency and madness in the technosphere. And that talk tomorrow will build on today's. So, Pat. Thank you. And this, oh, it is on, okay. I thought this was the trick part of the program, no. that <laughs> wouldn't work. Um, thank you. And. Um, I should say that, that for Etc. Group, we've been uh, chasing ambulances uh, for 40 years now. Uh, one technology after another shows up, takes off, and we realize that it's there and then try to address it. And uh, it started off with um, patenting of plant varieties and went from there to biotechnology, GMOs, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, geoengineering, um, blockchains and cryptocurrencies, and obviously big data in agriculture more broadly. So we spent a lot of time chasing these ambulances and recognized um, a few years ago that this was not the best way to do it. That somehow we have to recognize in societies that, that we, we need a capacity to be, for a civil society to understand what is coming on the horizon and have a system in place which allows for civil society assessment of those technologies. And that that's, gets us then, and I should add to that, that, that part of, of our concern with this was recognizing as we watched mergers taking place, mergers and acquisitions. Most recently, we've tracked with other colleagues here uh, the issues around Bayer and Monsanto, and BASF into this work as well. All of the convergences in agriculture, in convergences with between agriculture and Google and Microsoft and uh, Amazon, Alibaba, Tencent, all becoming part of the agricultural system now. And the OECD as well has recognized that these mergers are happening in large measure because of new technologies. So for us, the issue of and the need for some kind of a system in civil society for technology assessment uh, goes with our concern that competition policy, being driven largely by technologies, also has to be looked at. These two things together, technology assessment and competition policy. How they should be addressed is not easy to be sure about, but they need to be examined. The UN system had a capacity to do both of these things uh, up until about 1993. There was a UN Center for Transnational Corporations, and there was also a UN Center for Science and Technology for Development, which did try to monitor new technologies and advise at least the Global South about these technologies and what, what the issues might be. Neither did a particularly good job, but at least they were there, and there was some debate. In 1993, the United States stepped in 
and killed both of those UN agencies, cut the funding for them with enormous political pressure. So at the very moment when the whole world was talking about the internet and they talked then not about the data economy, but the knowledge economy, uh, the UN was given a frontal lobotomy. It simply lost its capacity to even think about these questions. Now, I'm sure it sounds almost absurd to suggest that the United Nations should be looked to to do any treaties about anything. And I can understand that. Um, but doing something at the UN can often stir interest uh, among national governments, especially national governments in the Global South, who see a debate at the United Nations and then say, hey, maybe we can do something regionally or nationally. And there are examples of where that has happened in the past, and it has been strong and helpful to have the resolutions in place and, and, and legislation then being passed by national governments. So a debate at the UN level can stir up national actions, but it can also perhaps have some impacts by itself. For example, if we had had um, uh, some closer collaboration with the Global South during this last round of mergers in agriculture, they could have been stopped quite easily. One third of the market in the world for pesticides, for example, is now um, in four countries. It's in, it's in India and China and Argentina and Brazil. If even two of those countries had said at the national level that they would refuse to allow the mergers, which they have every legal right to do, every sovereign right to do, then the shareholders would have said, oh, we won't have these mergers. It's a waste of money. We will make no profit here. And even if Brussels and Washington said yes to the mergers, it would have been no for the shareholders. So the capacity for the Global South to actually intervene and establish rules which will block the mergers, either as a collective group or through a UN treaty, I think at least is worth discussing and, and having a debate about. Doesn't mean that ultimately that, and I can, actually I can change this, I can guarantee you that any treaty that the UN produces, which would take five, 10, or 15 years, any treaty, none of us in this room would like. We would say at the end of the time, this is not the treaty we wanted to have. It might still be a lot better, however, than anything we're getting so far when mergers and acquisitions go through and when technologies are assessed. At least there'd be something. And nothing precludes the possibility, even with a treaty, of allowing national governments to say that they have exceptions by which they can intervene further and still block either mergers and acquisitions or still block certain technologies. It is still possible. So the creation of one level of treaty doesn't stop other levels having even stronger rules. So for us, I guess in, in, in et cetera group, our feeling is that we should stop chasing ambulances. We should take the risk of creating an environment in which civil society can do its own assessments of technologies and that can push national governments, and at the same time, we should be pushing for changes in competition policy. And as we do that, we should be putting pressure again at the UN level, at least for the media benefits of the UN level, to try to create a debate there and possibly even get uh, treaties established. So that's the proposition that is driving our concerns now and this is the best opportunity we have to raise it with you. I know there's been discussions here in Germany on competition policy and obviously from this conference a great deal of concern about technology assessment. So I'd like to leave it open for your thoughts about this and comments and questions and, and Lily can magistrate this. Yes, thank you. I've got my own microphone. <laughs> um, one question though for clarification maybe. I think um, Pat, you... Um, can you be a bit more concrete and give some examples of the role that Google, Amazon, Alibaba, and other big tech and big data companies play in the food chain? And also, why the need for technology assessment is so closely um, linked to the increase in corporate concentration? I think it'd be helpful okay. if you could give some concrete examples. Okay, uh, it'll, I'll end up talking a bit longer than I should probably. No, but I'll, that's fine. I'll, I'll be I'm fine. keeping track. Okay, well, um, I can start with the, answer that with a question. What is the biggest, who is the biggest seed company in the world today? Anyone? Any, any idea? 
You're afraid to answer, aren't you? It's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> the, the logical answer should be buyer. It has the largest seed sales in the world with its merger with Monsanto. The, but the real answer is we have no idea. We don't know. If you have to guess at which company in the world controls most of the agricultural data or data related to seeds, then the answer would be the Beijing Genomics Institute, BGI, which is a sort of private company in China. BGI has gone around the world this year going to international gene banks, asking them for duplicate samples of every seed they have in their international collections, also to national gene banks, and also to the so-called doomsday vault in Svalbard in, in Norway, where they have samples of just about everything, and ask them to have copies. And what they've promised in each case is that if they receive the seed samples, duplicates, which they will keep, they will make a genomic map of, of each, each, each variety, that's seven and a half million different seed varieties from 7,000 different crops. They'll map all of that and they'll, they'll share the map with the national or international gene bank. But they've, also, they've done this and started to do this. Many, many gene banks are saying no, but some have said yes. And when they do that, they, they, we, we found cases, of, uh, in the case of the International Rice Research Institute, for example, in, in the Philippines, where they've given back not all of the seeds, and they have patented the traits they found useful, which was against the contract agreement that was made. So while we, can't, we don't have all of the details, we do know that now BGI probably has more data about the world's food supply, about, about genes for crops, than any other company. Which means that at any point, BGI, for example, which is closely linked as well to, to um, a, a company called Sinochem. Sinochem in China bought, Chem, is buying, pardon me, ChemChina, which bought Syngenta. So suddenly this, this company, which is simply into data, is linked to seed and pesticide, a major seed and pesticide company in the world the world's third largest company. But it's not just that. I'll quickly just mention some other examples. Google today is advising farmers in China on how to increase the, the yield from swine, from, from hogs. Microsoft today is working with Carlsberg in, in Denmark on developing new, new uh, uh, yeasts for, for, for breweries, but also developing new barley varieties and other crops, wheat as well. Uh, we have a case now where, of course, Amazon has bought Whole Foods, the largest uh, organic uh, food retailer in the United States, but is also buying into China, into India, and into, into New Zealand, and perhaps other countries you don't know about yet. Um, all of these companies are getting into Google as well, and Uber as well, into, of course, food delivery systems. There's no part of the food chain that IT isn't moving into. So the database is the key thing for them. It's the control of the digital information which allows them to move into all parts of the agricultural system. The, perhaps the most immediate concern, and I'll end with this, is that now that these mergers have gone through among seed and pesticide companies, the logic is the next round of mergers, which will be two or three years from now at the earliest, not be even five years away, but it will take place, the next round of mergers will be between farm machinery companies and seed and pesticide companies. John Deere is the world's biggest farm machinery company. It has links already with joint ventures with all of the other seed and pesticide companies, strong ones, and has had for several years. And John Deere, in the end, can win because John Deere has the box that goes into the field, that the box that's used to plant the seeds and the pesticides and the fertilizers and spread the water. It also has the box that the end of the growing season goes back into the field and harvest the crop. And it has the sensors, it has the, the weather information, the weather data, the market data, to be able to analyze exactly what goes into the field and what comes out of the field, which means that they can dominate over Bayer or BASF or ChemChina or maybe not BGI, but the rest. So the connections between big data, digital information, is, is intense. 
And that, and again, it's not just the digital information of, of monitors and satellite systems, it is actually the digital information around genomics, digital DNA. Thank you. Um, so now it's open for questions and comments. You know, if you have any, any questions of understanding or also comments um, as to the proposition that Pat made on a new treaty. So maybe we see how many we have, whether we collect or immediately answer. Maybe you can introduce yourself briefly for Pat. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, Pat. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Stefan. Um, well, and I, I feel the urge to add my last name, since in Europe we uh, usually use the full name. Anyway, I'm Stefan. Nice to meet you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, two small questions. Uh, and maybe it's just the fault of the lack of knowledge on my side. Uh, but first of all, I, I did not really understand um, how uh, Brazil or Chile, for example, uh, could possibly intervene in the international merger system or in the international legal uh, rights concerning merger systems as of now, uh, since usually it's only the sites where the companies are based in. Uh, and maybe there, there is something I just didn't uh, get. And uh, the, the second one was, I didn't really understand uh, about what window you were talking. Uh, is there in the moment, are there uh, international negotiation rounds within the UN framework going on about setting up such uh, international merger regulation framework? Um, yeah, I would be glad if, if, I can, if you could add some, some more details. Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you, Stefan. The first question is, is that there is no international regime regarding competition policy or technology assessment. And the competition policy one has been a big gap, in fact, in all of the trade negotiations. No one has ever tried to fill that gap. So when a, one country or one company chooses to buy another company, it's not just between the host countries. Wherever that country operate, where that company operates in the world, that country has a right to say yes or no to the merger. So when buyers said they wanted to buy Monsanto, they also recognized that they had to get agreement in at least 30 countries around the world where they, were, they had significant operations. All those countries had to say yes or that the merger would not be effective in that country. So if, if Argentina, for example, and Brazil together had said no to the mergers, that means they just would not have been functional in, in that part of the world. And, and again, for, for shareholders, if they can't get the merger working in their major markets, there's no point in having the merger. So it really is a matter of national decisions. The tragedy has been that national governments don't even think about it very often. They, just, they simply assume what I think probably many people in this room assume, that is up to Brussels and Washington, and leave it at that, uh, and, and don't realize that, in fact, uh, they, they could say no, and, and they just get walked over now. So the second question was... was uh, is, is there, no. There, there's discussions, and they've been quite intense in the last year and a half. Um, there's, at the lowest level in some ways, they're in the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, which has a model law on competition policy. They would like to see it strengthened, but they're quite a weak UN agency. There is a conversation going on in the Forum on Science and Technology for Innovation, that's what it's called, in the United Nations in New York which is recently established, where governments are talking about the need to understand what's happening in competition policy. And national governments, I think around the world, are saying the mergers that have been allowed to go through in, in, uh, in agriculture and in some ways in pharmaceuticals are so severe that it's clearly a failure in competition law. So from the far right, the Chicago School of Economists, right through to the left, we've got regulators and academics as well saying something's wrong with, with competition policy, we've got to change this. So there, this is a moment for change, I think. If you're interested in that debate in Germany, there is um, a civil society-led debate, the Konzernmacht Initiative. I'm sure there are people in this room involved in it. My name is Michael Record, uh, working for an organization called PowerShift, and I'm more working on uh, metals and minerals. And uh, we see in the metals and minerals the harvest of the ore, more or less, and the transport and the trade is controlled sometimes by only a limited number of companies. And they have the possibility of price manipulation and price building. Uh, I would be interesting uh, if you see the merger of John Deere and some pesticide companies, how much influence will they have on the price building and how much power will they have on price manipulation? 
Um, well, we can't be sure, of course, but it, it's, uh, I mean, already there was a great deal of concern when we had the mergers among the most recent seed and pesticide companies. When John Deere, uh, about two years ago now, tried to buy some of the, the big data information uh, uh, material, uh, companies that, that uh, Monsanto owned, uh, they were stopped from making that merger uh, by both the United States and Brazil that time. It, it was a small part of Monsanto, and it was all of John Deere being interested in it. But uh, there was a concern that if John Deere was able to acquire that part of Monsanto, they were looking for the sensor information part, that they would have 87.5% of the global market for agricultural sensors. So they did stop that. But as, as these mergers have gone through now, which are just absurdly powerful and large with Bayer and Monsanto, uh, it becomes easier and easier for the next round of mergers to say, well, we're just going to the next logical step. So I think, and the concern there is in terms of is price for sure, but it's also control of information. Monsanto, or pardon me, John Deere could know literally everything that's happening in a farmer's field from, from planting to harvest, and again, have more information than anybody else has, which means that, in fact, John Deere will be able to step into the role that's being played now by the big grain trading companies, Cargill, Bungie, uh, Dreyfus, uh, uh, Archer Daniels Midland, the big tr trading companies, Glencore, um, are all uh, you know, in doubt now as to what their future will be because they won't control the same information that, that the farm machinery companies could control. More questions? Don't be shy. Don't be overwhelmed you must with think the bad it's, news. You must think it's <laughs> absurd to, to talk about the UN. I'm sure there must be some, some feelings that a UN treaty is ridiculous. <laughs> I'm setting myself up here. If not, I want to just pick on one issue that you've touched upon, but I think it's maybe worthwhile diving into it a bit more at this conference, and that is the big data um, when it big data problem when it comes to digital um, genetic information. Because um, right now, as we stand here today, the, the UN conference um, of the, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity um, started in, in Egypt. So they're negotiating, they're meeting in Egypt now for the next two weeks, and the conference was open today. And one of the sort of biggest topics of high political concern for many, many developing countries around the world that is hotly discussed now in Egypt is exactly that question, a capacity to at exponential speed decode um, genetic information and put it into gigantic databases. And there is even, you know, at, at Davos earlier this year, they launched a new initiative, the, world, the, the Earth Biogenome Project, that has the intention to decode um, the DNA of every li living thing on planet Earth and put it in one data database, the Earth Bank of Codes. And I'm wondering what you have to say, sort of how do we deal with this new data, big data problem? Because that's a different beast than data derived from our you know, personal consumption habits and you know, mobility and you know, the data associated with people. This is data sort of based on our DNA and yeah. the DNA all of, of plants. All of living and nature. Yeah. 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 And that, that's, um, I'm, it, 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 and the, the term that's being used in most UN negotiations is DSI, uh, digital sequence information, which makes it all seem rather detached and irrelevant somehow. Uh, but it is, it is the DNA of life, and it's of all species. The Earth Bank of Codes, which the World Economic Forum proposed in January, and which is now launching itself, in fact, in, in the Amazon in Brazil, uh, great timing for that, um, is, um, uh, is the first effort to try to do this, to, to literally map, or the, the map, to get the genomic maps of every living thing that's in the Amazon. Um, that's going to be a slow and cumbersome process for sure, but they, they are moving with it. The BGI initiative I mentioned at the beginning is really aimed at, at agricultural species, although they're also looking at the wild relatives of cultivated crops, which is a wider range again. And that, that's, that's financially viable, it's, it's physically practical, it's technologically practical to do it, and they, they are moving. And that really does scare me because, uh, I mean, both scare me. But the, the BGI uh, ability then is that they can take this cloud of information they're gathering 
And again, because of, of, the, of, the, of the management of the data with supercomputers, they can then start to adjust the DNA of any species to in any traits they'd like to adjust. And, and that's the, the bigger alarm. We had an, there was kind of a, an emergency meeting that was held in, at the end of July in Paris uh, of a, about five governments, and I, I was able to attend it as well, but, and, and all the major companies. And the meeting was held because of the BGI case. But what surprised me was when the meeting took, it was just a two-day meeting, but the meeting took place was, and it was all off the records discussion, so I can't go into the detail, but what we found out was that while BGI is doing this on a global scale, the private companies have already been doing one-on-one, one -on -one going to different national gene banks and international banks to get duplicates of everything. So that the companies like the Monsantos and, and Dow's and DuPont's at that point were almost yawning over the fact that BGI is doing it as well. Uh, it has moved so dramatically. And the other big battle that's taking place, of course, in Egypt right now with the Biodiversity Convention is around gene drives, where it's possible to take the clouds of data from in agriculture or outside of agriculture and then tweak that data with a gene drive to force through a trait into, into, into where this malaria, anti-malarial work with mosquitoes in, in, in Africa or sorghum varieties uh, to change the DNA any way they wish. Which would be a technology that could be used for plant extinction of entire species yeah. or manipulation and modification of entire ecosystems up, on, you know, up to a global planetary scale, which is why our yeah. colleagues are not here with us, but in Egypt are fighting to get a moratorium, yeah. at least on that technology. Pat, some have described this, I've heard people talk about this Earth Bank of Codes as the, the Internet of Life, building on the idea of the Internet of Things. Do you yeah. think that's a fair description? Is that what's coming next? You're good at horizon scanning and telling us what's next. So is that the next thing to worry about? Well, these technologies always are, are, talk, you know, are, are uh, exaggerated. Um, but they're only exaggerated for the first generation. Uh, the first 10 or 20 years, they don't work very well. Then they start to work more effectively. So if they're collecting the information, the tragedy is, I think, honestly, in this case, is uh, in fact, uh, whether it's the Earth Bank of Codes dealing with everything or BGI dealing with, with, with crop uh, diversity and livestock diversity, is that suddenly the living material is irrelevant. Suddenly what's in the gene bank or what's in the farmer's field, that diversity is no longer commercially important because they've got it digitized. It's no longer needed. And it's digitized in a gene bank in, in Beijing, or it's digitized in, in, in Svalbard, perhaps, but it's not available to farmers any longer. And that, that's, the, that's a huge danger, and whether the technology works or not, if, if suddenly the living material is thought to be worthless and is pushed out of the marketplace, that's where the danger lies immediately. Yeah, so while we've been dis 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 discussing here mostly today how digital technologies could be used or could not be used to s sort of preserve the nature that we have, um, this is about how they can be used to create a completely different new nature. Yeah, exactly that. <laughs> Which is an entire, entirely different ball sure. game. Um, I don't know if there's any, any really urgent last comment or question. We're about to close. I'm looking around. I didn't see any more hands, but I don't know if you've... Uh, yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> Just want to make sure that people know if you're interested, this caught your attention. Come back tomorrow morning at, at 10 for our Efficiency and Madness panel. Yeah. But the point really is, this is I've been focusing mostly on agriculture because that's where Center Group has been doing most of its work over the years. This applies every bit as much to the mining industry as it does to the energy industry, as it does to the pharmaceutical industry, uh, and, to, and to IT in general. It covers every sector of the economy. We're dealing with the same issues. If we don't have a capacity for civil society assessing technologies, a grassroots capacity, whatever we do with the UN treaty or national law changes, um, we need to create a common cause here, working together to say we have to have that. It's simply insane not to uh, in this world today with all the changes being driven by the technological changes. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for staying on. <laughs>